Okay. The next speaker is Tim Maulin from New York University, who is going to talk about the emer emergence uh, of the Euclidean and Minkowski structure from discrete space time. Okay. This team, when you want, you can start. Okay. Uh, everybody can. Everybody can see that. Yes. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Um, well, I don't have much time. This is all results that have. I figured out in the last month, and this is the first time I'm presenting them. So uh, I don't know quite how long this is going to take. I, I'll I'll try and go quickly. Um, everything is conceptually kind of really trivial. The results to me were a little bit astonishing. Okay, so I've been playing around with uh, for some years trying to think about how to do space-time geometry with a discrete foundation rather than a continuum and so this is uh this is uh some recent results so here here are some things just to kind of contextualize this or motivate it a bit um so we start of course when we learn physics we start with classical physics newtonian mechanics i'm including special and general relativity as you know the kind of uh ultimate flourishing of a classical picture. Uh, but we know that all of that is wrong, right? At some level, um, all of Newtonian mechanics, right? Newtonian mechanics is not on the correct uh, uh, physical foundations. Maxwellian electrodynamics is not on correct physical foundations. General relativity, it's a little bit harder to know exactly what has to give. Uh, we know that something's going to have to give in putting together uh, a theory of gravity with the rest of quantum mechanics. Um, I, uh, you know, the, the, the failure in a certain sense of classical physics is kind of radical. The stability, you know, that matter is stable, uh, can't be obviously recovered from a Maxwellian picture of electromagnetic interactions. But um, right now, I just want to point to two actual physical phenomena that we know we need to account for. And one is the aharonov bohm effect, which doesn't have any natural understanding in terms of a, a, a classical picture of electromagnetics. Um, it somehow has been taken to suggest, and I think this is correct, although you have to be careful about what it means, that the, the, the fields, the electric and magnetic fields are not really physically fundamental. Um, something else is. And, and then the big one, of course, is violations of Bell's inequality for experiments done at space-like separation. We know that you can't get that out of uh, classical electromagnetic theory or, uh, or general relativity or special relativity. Um, because they're local theories and they just won't allow for, for, for those phenomena. So we have to do something. Now, how do we deal with the non-locality? And this, this is actually also having to do with Aronoff bohm although I won't go into that now. How do we deal with that? How do we actually make that tractable in a mathematically clear way? Well, um, there's an obvious way to do it, a kind of very simple-minded way to do it, which is just to add a preferred foliation to the space-time. That would give us the resources to define instant, various sorts of instantaneous uh, physical connections between space-like separated events, where instantaneous is defined in terms of this preferred foliation. And if we do that, then we, of course, uh, you know, we just have this preferred foliation, and we do the fundamental dynamics in terms of uh, things succeeding, states succeeding states in this foliation, then we have no problems about causal loops or temporal paradoxes or anything like that, right? Because everything, all, all the temporal structure is going to be kept straight and straightforward by, by this foliation. Um, now, one way to, that, that, that you can do this which is you could say the cheap way is just to add the foliation in. That is, you, you start with a Lorentz standard Lorentzian kind of metric that you'd get out of general relativity and throw a metric on top, throw, throw a foliation on top of it and use that foliation 
uh, in the course of formulating your dynamical laws, they're kind of easy to do a Bohmian kind of theory <clears throat> in that setting. It's kind of easy to do a GRW-like theory in that setting where you, you make use of the foliation in a very straightforward way. Um, but just throwing a foliation down on, on otherwise arbitrary Lorentzian structure seems kind of brute force and a bit unmotivated. <clears throat> so what I, one thing I've been looking at is something that is much more radical, but much less arbitrary. That is, I'm gonna start from a new foundation where this foliation is naturally gonna be there from the beginning, okay? Um, and so, What's the conceptual basis? Well, the other thing is that, that, I, that I wanted to do is to reject the relativist account of space-time at, at, at the very first step. That is, you do not start with a four-dimensional differentiable manifold. Um, you don't start with a continuum. You start with a discrete structure, right? You start with a discrete geometry. Now, if you do that, um, and again, I could argue this, but, but kind of easy to see that it's actually now going to be very hard to avoid there being a preferred foliation. Um, certainly, if you have a, a discrete underpinning like this, you can't have anything like a continuous symmetry, like uh, symmetry under Lorentz boosts. And more or less, because each geometrical object has immediately uh, neighboring adjacent objects, those adjacency relations are gonna to tend to pick out a preferred foliation automatically. Okay, so um, where do we hope might come from this? Well, obviously, you know, I'm rejecting uh, 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 any kind of classical or relativistic picture of space-time at a foundational level, but, the tremendous empirical success of classical physics and the tremendous empirical success of relativity, both special and general, means that you would need to explain why theories based on a continuum or based on a, a four-dimensional manifold with a Lorentz metric, why do they do so well, right? Why are they so empirically successful, given that I'm saying at a fundamental level, they're wrong. <laughs> Now, we've done this before, right? Um, it means somehow showing that something like the relativistic structure that we use emerges in a natural way from this quite different foundation um, and emerges usually by some kind of statistical considerations, considerations of coarse graining or something like that, right? Um, now, you know, we've, we, we know that this kind of thing can happen. It's, it, it, you might say, isn't it surprising that an emergent physics can be so very different in its character from the underlying physics from which it emerges? But we know that happens, right? Because we know that in some sense, Newtonian mechanics approximately emerges from quantum mechanics. We know that Newtonian gravitational theory in some sense approximately emerges from the general theory of relativity. And in e each of those cases, the underlying theory is of quite a different character than the one that emerges. But you think you have a perfectly good understanding at the end of the day, from the perspective of the underlying theory, why these other theories that were actually quite wrong, um, nonetheless, were very empirically successful. Okay, so that's the kind of prologue. Let me just get down into the nitty gritty details because that's what most of this talk is. So I'm gonna start, <clears throat> let me just start with space, spatial structure. Um, well, it, we're gonna put in time a little later, but the, the point is that both of these starting points are pretty much as non-relativistic as you can possibly imagine, okay? Um, that is, there's, there's, I guarantee there's no attempt to make this look relativistic at a foundational level. And just, you might say just the opposite. Um, what was the motivation? Well, the motivation was, let's see if we can do discrete geometry. 
and do that in a kind of the simplest, most natural way and see what happens. Uh, and I can only give you my word that when I started developing this whole thing, I was not even vaguely considering what might emerge from it. I was just trying to write some stuff down that seemed to make sense. Um, there are choice points when you do this, when you say, all right, what kind of discrete geometry am I going to use? I'll indicate some of those choice points. Um, but the choices that I made are, again, pretty simple and pretty straightforward. They don't, they don't look arbitrary. They don't look you know, artificial because they're really not. Uh, and from this foundation that is, as it were, completely non-relativistic in, in almost every sense, surprisingly to me, something very relativistic emerges naturally at a mathematical level. And that's what I want to go through. So how do we do discrete geometry? Again, all of this is just the way I do it. I didn't get this from anybody. I made all this stuff up. It'll all be completely unfamiliar to you, but it's very simple and straightforward. Um, so if I have an n-dimensional space and I want to think of it as fundamentally made of, as it were, geometrically atomic objects, I'm going to have different dimensional atomic objects. And so I just indicate these as n elements where n is the dimensionality. There'll be zero elements, which you can think of as points, one elements, which are one dimensional atomic objects. You can think of them as the little lines, uh, two elements, which are surfaces, right? Atomic surfaces, three elements, which are atomic volumes. You could continue up. We have no need to go beyond three spatial dimensions. And these various elements are related to one another as bounded to boundary to bounded. Every one element has a pair of zero elements as their boundary, uh, for example. Okay, so you, you just would, would indicate the whole thing by incidence matrices that tells you which n elements bound which n plus one elements. That'll give you the whole structure. Um, so the zero elements bound the one elements, the one element, uh, and, and every one element is bounded by a pair of zero elements. That's just the relation between points and lines. Once you get up to two dimensions, this, the, the surface elements, the two dimensional ones, you have a choice. You have uh, an infinite number of choices. One thing you, so essentially you're asking, what's the shape of an atomic surface? Um, now, the, the standard, there's a standard choice here made, which is to make them triangles, right? Because that's the simplest two dimensional polygon. Um, and then when you go up to three dimensions to, to make the three dimensional things tetrahedra, because those are the simplest polyhedra. And that root, that particular choice of a path leads you to the theory of simplexes, which is probably pretty well known. Um, my guess is many people have heard about simplexes one way or another. That's not the way I went. That's not the way we're going to go. If you go that other way, as far as I can tell, and I haven't looked in this in great detail, you won't get any of the results, anything like the results I'm going to show you. So I think this is actually quite an important decision, right? I'm not going to go points, lines, triangles, tetrahedra, okay? Uh, well, what's the obvious thing, to, other thing to do? Um, well, make the two elements quadrilaterals, or if you will, squares that have not three, but four bounding one elements and uh, make the, the volume elements prisms, or if you will, cubes that have six bounding two elements. Um, and the, 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 the scarecrows are there because, of course, I haven't done anything to introduce any notion of angle or distance here. This is all, as it were, at a purely topological level. So I can't literally say they're cubes or they're squares, but they are quadrilaterals or uh, 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 volume elements that have four, uh, six quadrilaterals as their bounding surfaces. Um, good. 
So we're going to build it up that way. But just, you know, a, a small historical note, that's the way Euclid does it, right? So he says you start with a point. If you move a point, you get a line, right? That's your one dimensional element. If you move a line in an orthogonal direction, you get a rectangle. That's your two dimensional element. If you move a rectangle in an orthogonal direction, you know, you get a, you get, you get a prism. That's your three dimensional element. So we're doing that instead of simplexes. Uh, and I'm going to depict them just using squares and cubic grids because that's the easy thing to think about. But obviously, the the actual angle relations and so on are are not there. Good. So here's a proto you know a prototypical two space discrete two space. Each of the squares would be a two element. They're bounded. Each one is bounded by four one elements, and each one element is bounded by a pair of of uh, zero elements, which you can think of as the, you know, the corners of the squares. And here's a, a prototypical discrete three space. We now have the, uh, the three, three elements, which are the cubes, and they're bounded by the two elements and so on. So I, you know, I take it everybody's following this. It's kind of trivial. Um, it's not the only thing you could do, but it's a pretty straightforward, trivial thing to do. Good. First point, this is not Euclidean. It, 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 if you treat these elements as atomic, which we're doing, so we don't think of the, of the one elements as composed out of an infinite number of points. They're not, right? They're bounded by a pair of points, but they don't have any points inside them. Um, this is just not any kind of Euclidean geometry. If we wanted, there's a kind of metric that naturally comes along because it's discrete and we can count things. There's a kind of counting metric that comes along. And if you use that to define lengths and distances, then you get uh, in the two dimensional case, you get what's commonly referred to as taxi cab geometry, right? So you just count how far is it from, from, from this point to this point? Well, you have all of these continuous paths that can take you from here to here which go via connecting one elements. And you take the shortest such path uh, and, and call that the distance, right? And if you do that, then the circles, I mean, the things you would define as circles just don't look circular, right? They look, they, they look like squares. So uh, the point C, what I've indicated on, on there are all of the points that are three units away from C in the taxi cab geometry. Um, you can go straight up or straight to the side, three units, or you can go over two and up one, or up one and over two, or you know, uh, and you get this thing that looks like a square. And, and if you did the same thing, centered it at point D, you would get another square, and the the, the thing to notice is that those two squares meet each other and overlap along an entire side, right? They don't meet each other at a point. Whereas in a Euclidean geometry, if we were drawing circles, uh, the first point where a, 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 a circle centered at C could meet a circle centered at D, they would meet at a point, right? And then as they got larger, they would share a pair of points. So, this is a non-Euclidean kind of structure, even at a topological level, even without bringing in metrical information uh, in a certain way. This is very non-Euclidean. Obviously, it has preferred directionality in it, which a Euclidean two-space does not have, right? You, you have kind of the vertical direction and the horizontal direction, and these are in a way completely different. Every uh, one element, is as it were either oriented this way or oriented this way. And you could define that in a perfectly rigorous way. Good. So I don't know of any sense, if you just looked at this discrete structure and its taxi cab geometry, I don't know of any sense in which you would be inclined to say that anything Euclidean emerges, even if you go to very high scale, right? Even if you imagine kind of zooming out and having one of these grids with billions and billions of elements in it, 
um, the intrinsic geometry would still be non-Euclidean. The things, you know, even at large scale, the things that you would define as circles would still be, as it were, quadrilaterals, and they would meet along edges and things like that. So um, just going to larger scale or just taking in, in any straightforward way statistical considerations, whatever that might mean, I at least don't see anything Euclidean emerging from this. Good. Um, the, the preferred directionality also at, at large scale, even if you were far away and you, as it were, couldn't see the microscopic details, still it seems like the, these two directions uh, would be preferred geometrically and that, that maintains even at very high scale. It doesn't wash out. Good. So that's the, that's the spatial structure. So that's for two dimensions. For three dimensions, we would use a cubic grid. We want to make a space time. So we want to add in some temporal structure. We want to add in time. And um, the whole point of a discrete geometry is that there is an adjacency relation, right? You can, you can ask of any point, what are the immediately neighboring points, meaning points that are the other boundary of a single line, right? A single one element. Those are the, near, the, the nearest ones and then the next nearest ones and so on. Um, similarly, you can say that two, two elements, two of these, these surface elements are adjacent to each other if they have a common one element as a boundary, right? So there is a kind of adjacency relation, which just doesn't exist in a continuum. In a continuum, no point is next to another point. No surface is, you know, uh, I mean, certainly no point is next to another point. You could have two surfaces that share a boundary. Um, so we're going to do the same thing with time. We're going to make it discrete, which means for any event, there will be the immediately preceding ones and the immediately succeeding ones in time. And following that model, okay, we, we're, we're gonna introduce arrows and the arrows are arrows and they have a directionality because time has a directionality, um, connecting different layers of this spatial structure so that by following the arrows, they'll take you from any n element to its immediate successors in time. Good. Um, and therefore, it's, it's already easy to see what we're building before we've done anything else. There's going to be an intrinsic foliation, right? Because we're going to build up the space time in these layers. We're going to take a spatial layer, put another spatial layer above it, and draw arrows one way or another from the one below to the next one, and then from that one to the next one, and from that one to the next one, and so on. Um, and so again, at a foundational level, this is as non-relativistic as you could imagine. It has a foliation built into it from the beginning, not added arbitrarily to something else, all right? Um, and the only question really left to us, if we've, if we've settled on the spatial structure of, these, of each of these layers, is how do we run these connections, these temporal connections between one layer and the next one? And here, again, there are different choices you could make. I'm going to talk about three of them. Um, and I'm going to do this for the two spaces because they're easier to draw, but everything sort of goes through the same way for the three spaces. How am I doing? Okay, okay, okay. okay. All right, so you can, you can sort of think, take a layer, put another layer directly above it and draw arrows up, only up to the immediate ones above and you get something that would correspond to absolute Newtonian discrete space time. Why? Because Newton thought of absolute space as persisting through time. So each spatial point identically remains through time and can be re-identified at later times. And that unique relation would be indicated by having only a single arrow here from each point to the succeeding point to the succeeding point to the succeeding point. Um, 
Now that, however, that structure would be a complete disaster physically if we want to use this the way I want to use it. What do I mean? I mean, first of all, this would support a notion of absolute rest as, it, as, as there is in Newtonian absolute space. An object would remain at absolute rest if it always stays in the same, as it were, the same persisting point of space. Yeah? But the problem is, um, what I want to do is use these arrows to give me continuous paths through space time, continuous temporal paths, that is, the paths that, say, a particle could follow. And if I only have these vertical paths, it means nothing can move, right? The, the points of space can't move, but also particles couldn't move either. The only, the only place they could go at the next temporal moment would be directly above, and everything would be frozen, okay? So uh, everything would have, you not only have a notion of absolute rest, but everything would have to remain at absolute rest. So that would be a disaster. All right, so that's one thing we could do, bad idea. Here's, we could go the other direction and say, look, let's connect up every N element on one layer with every N element on the next one, right? So there's no preferred relation at all between the, the spatial elements at one moment and the spatial elements at, at another. That, of course, gets extremely messy. I didn't even draw them all in, but you get the idea. Okay, this would be sort of corresponding to a Gal what we think of as a Galilean space-time, where there is no preferred relationship between an event at one time and any event at any other time. But that's equally a disaster because now there's no restriction on these, what you count as a continuous temporal path, sort of any selection of any N element, you know, say, say point from every one of the layers will count as a continuous path because there'll be an arrow that goes from this one to that one, to, then to this one, then to that one, okay? So you kind of lose any interesting space-time structure at all. That's a bad idea. Um, so what's the solution? Well, one doesn't work and infinitely many don't work. So, so let's just look at finitely many. Um, and there are different ways that you could do that. And instead of trying to walk you through them, I'm just going to go to the one that turns out to give you really nice results. Um, so this is what I call a simple discrete three-dimensional space-time. We're not going to have any absolute rest at the fundamental level because each zero element, right, for example, or two element, has four immediate temporal successors. So from from this point, I can immediately go at the next layer to four different points, none of which counts any more than any of the others as staying in the same place, right? Um, and the key to this is you don't stack the layers vertically above each other, but you displace them so that, uh, as it were in this diagram, directly above a point in this layer will be the center of a square on the next layer, okay? So you, you, you uh, displace them from each other in that way. And, and then you go back and, and above, the, above that, you're then back to the original. So the, the uh, and then you put um, arrows from each point to the four corners of the, of the square above it, yeah? Uh, it's easier to understand by seeing it. So there's what this thing looks like. Uh, and maybe it's even easier to see it from above. If you kind of look down on it, you would see that the, the we have this one square grid and then the second square grid with the solid points is displaced from it so that the, the points in the original grid fall at the centers of the squares of the next layer up. And then you put four arrows going out as it were northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest. So there, there are four ways you can go. Good. Um, now, there will now be, you, you obviously do not have, you, if particles could follow these arrows, they're not now stuck the way they were originally and can only go up. Um, and there's a kind of light cone structure. So there's something that looks a little bit relativistic here. Because from this point, there are only four points I can get to in the next layer, and then a limited number I can get to in the next. And I mean, the, the thing becomes larger as you go up. So there's something that kind of looks like a light cone. Um, there's no state of absolute rest because it, you know one way to think about this is like the fundamental connections are all light-like. 
um, they're all null. And from any point, there are four ways you can go. And so there, you can't stay at rest, right? If, if a particle had to do that, if a particle wanted to, as it were, try to go straight up this diagram, it could only do it by something we might think of as Zitterbewegung, right? It's gotta be kind of oscillating around as it goes up. Um, there is a kind of emergent notion of absolute rest here, because if I take not this layer and the one right above it, but the one above that, then a point here will be preferentially related to a particular point two layers up by there being the maximum number of connections to it, right? So if I go from here to the one as it were straight above it, there are four ways I can get there. I can go this way, that way, that way, that way. I can get to other points up here, but there, there are fewer roots, right? So if I look at, if I ask what is, which point above this one is maximally connected to it by continuous paths, that does pick out something like an emergent state that you could call absolute rest. So again, you might say extremely non-relativistic. And the other thing that's very still non-relativistic here is if we call the light cone, if I take any event, any, any zero element, and I just follow the arrows and see where could you get from there, I get this growing structure, but it's, it's a square based pyramid, right? It's not, it doesn't look like a cone, right? It's, it, it just looks like a bigger and bigger pyramid. Um, and if I, if I take a, a horizontal cross section through it, those will, be, those will be squares. So just as with the taxi cab geometry, I don't seem to have anything that looks at all relativistic, okay? So again, it's seen from above, I mean, so if I started at some point, you can go out to the next four points. And if I cut through that, I get a square. And then if you think of all the places I could go from those four points, those are gonna make a bigger square and a bigger square and a bigger square. Good. So where are we now? I'm sorry, I'm rushing so fast, but I know I don't have much time. So we have a discrete space time, has a light cone structure, otherwise has a completely different character than Minkowski space time in many different ways. There's a preferred foliation. Spatial geometry has preferred directions in it. There's an emergent state of absolute rest. None of this occurs in Minkowski space-time. And they retain at arbitrarily large scales. They don't in any obvious sense wash out just because you go to, you know, you go to high scales. However, and this is kind of a shock, something very close to a Minkowski structure naturally emerges. How is that? Well, Let's think about degrees of temporal connectability. I already did that when I talked about this emergent state of absolute rest. I said, from this point, what point above it can I has the most distinct paths that lead to it, right? So I can count, because this is all discrete. I can just count these paths. And so between any pair of, of these one elements, I can count the number of distinct continuous temporal paths that will take you from there, from, from, from there to there could be zero, then we'd say they're space-like separated. Um, that count is directly connected mathematically to Pascal's triangle and the binomial distribution in ways that are probably familiar if you think about it. Um, but the key here is that you don't actually use Pascal's triangle, but you use this thing, Pascal's square-based pyramid, which is something I only learned about in the last couple months, but it's very simple. It's like Pascal's triangle, except taken up to three dimensions. So um, here's Pascal's square base pyramid. Imagine stacking cubes up like this uh, in a kind of ziggurat. And then again, just like with Pascal's triangle, put a one in the top and then in every lower layer, just add the numbers that connect to it. So the next ones down, I'll get a one. And then the next layer down, you know, you get ones in the corners and then twos and then a four in the middle. That's again, the, the, the middle one there has the most connections. And it's easy to see you're again, just counting distinct paths that you could take through this structure from the top down to any of these parts, okay? So that's Pascal's square base pyramid. There's a Pascal's triangular base pyramid, which does different things. We're not using that, we're using this stuff. Yeah, sorry. If we cut through this at, say, the fifth level, here are the numbers that you would get. 
Uh, and so these would be, again, the number of distinct continuous paths from that top down to any of these cells. And you notice two things. There's the, well, there are really three important features that this set of numbers have. I'll just mention what they are, and then you can go back and look and see that they're there. Uh, the first feature is that if we look along each edge, we just get the numbers from Pascal's triangle. That is, we get the normal binomial distribution. So you know, one, four, six, four, one along the edges. The second really important fact is that in the, in the interior- Sorry, Tim, you have already reached the 30 minutes. You can continue using the time for question if you want. Yeah, I, I have to. I mean, I'm, 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 okay. I'm just getting to the payoff, okay? okay, okay. I'm sorry, but I've, I've never done this before. Okay, the interior you get by a multiplication table, okay? So you'll notice all the numbers in the middle are just this, the, the product of the corresponding numbers along the edges, yeah? Uh, and that you can prove is always true. And then the third fact we're gonna use is that as these numbers get large, we know the binomial distribution is well approximated by the Gaussian, which we have there, okay? Now that's just an approximation. It only kicks in when the numbers get large and you have to stay away from the tails and stuff like that. It's a good approximation. So let's use those three facts. So since if we introduce coordinates along the edges so that the center of the edge is zero, of the x-axis, right? The center of the edge is, is the zero of the y-axis. Then we get the interior numbers by multiplying together these two Gaussians. This is gonna be a good approximation. And if you just look at the final result there, it means the degree of connectability, you'll notice goes as e to the minus two over sigma squared, x squared plus y squared. That means any cells, if we now number these cells by integers, which is what we're doing, any pair of cells on a given layer where x squared plus y squared are about, about the same number have the same degree of connectability, right? They have about the same degree of temporal connectability to the top. So in a very strict sense, a circular kind of structure emerges as loci of equal temporal connectability to the top, right? And that emerges in a pretty strict sense, although you do have to stay away from the tails, you don't get too close to the edges. It emerges in, in those conditions where the Gaussian is a good approximation to the binomial distribution. So that's part of what we wanted to do, all right? Those are my caveats. Um, here are some actual numbers, right? If we go up to the thousandth level, and we compare the connectability of these two points, 200, 0, and 141, 141, you'll see the connectabilities are almost exactly the same. And if we square those and add them, those numbers are almost exactly the same, right? So if we just look at loci of almost the same connectability, they look more and more like circles. Um, what if we cut vertically and look over time? to loci of equal, of vertical cross sections. Well, we know in Minkowski geometry, if we take a cross section like that and we look for points of equal proper time from the origin, that'll be a hyperbola, right? And the, the, the thing would be delta t squared minus delta x squared equals a constant. What if we cut through Pascal's pyramid? Well, the, the, the solid line, that's our hyperbola. That's what we're aiming at. And these all lines at the top are approximate, are regions of approximately the same connectivity through time using, this is using Sterling's formula for an approximation. So if you just look at that hyperbola and you look at these things above, that looks really, really close. Let me just give you the, the, an exact calculation. Um, let's suppose we know that a hyperbola is fixed. Once we have the symmetry, it's fixed by two data points. So I'm gonna give you two data points and then, and then uh, so I'm gonna go up to the 800 level. I'm sorry I'm doing this so quickly, but this is the last thing I'm doing. Go up to the 800th level, right? And look at the central point. We can exactly calculate the degree of connectability. It's this 3.5 3 uh, times 10 to the 478, okay? That's at the center. Now go up 10 levels, go up to the, 810th layer 
and look for the point that has the nearest degree of connectability. That turns uh, along, along what we can think of as the x-axis. That turns out to be 75 cells along off to the side. And there's the calculation. You'll see it's almost exactly the same connectability. So now I have two points. Now I'm going to fit those to a hyperbola, which if, you know the best fit is this number here that I'm giving you. And I'm going to use that hyperbola to make a prediction for a thousand layers, right? To go up another 190 layers. And so if I use the hyperbola, the prediction would be 354.60, which we need to round it to an integer. So we'll round it to 355. And now let's do the exact calculation. Again, something times 10 to the 478. So this hyperbola is a really good approximation that's giving you equal degrees of temporal connectability in this discrete structure. Now in a four dimensional space time, we do the same thing. We just use cubes and now I'm at my conclusion. So what's the conclusion? Even though the foundation is profoundly non-relativistic in every possible way, right? Within restricted bounds where these approximations like the Gaussian are good, we get something very close to a Minkowskian structure as a purely mathematical fact. Now, in order for that to have physical significance, we would need the physical laws to be sensitive to degrees of temporal connectability, which is just counting the number of different paths through this structure. And my last comment is one approach to understanding quantum theory is sum over paths, right? Which was pushed by Feynman, which at least gives you a suggestion that looking at temporal connectability via paths is not a physically irrelevant thing to be looking at. And now I'm done. Well, thanks, Tim, for your talk. We have time for a question. Anyone have a, a question? OK, Elias, you can ask. Hi, Tim. Thanks for, for the talks. Really, really nice. Yeah, actually, my, my, my question was uh, it's related to the last things that you mentioned about this connectivity. I, I mean, one, one would have thought that, um, that you would need to relate a proper time, like in the analogy, proper time to the length of the path, right? Like, like right. how many steps you need to take. But instead, you need to use this connectivity, which is related to, to the, the number of ways you can that's right. So I don't know if, if there's anything else you can uh, say about it. And I mean, it, I, I, I mean, think it is counterintuitive. Hey, look, I, I agree. It's I mean, you know, there, there are two points here. There's a purely mathematical fact that the, the, the yeah, damn I, I, count I of connectivity does what you want it to do. And then you're absolutely right. What I need is now a physics where degree of connectivity matters. Yeah. Right. Where now. Of course, counting is not a particularly good idea because we know that, as it were, proper time acts oppositely than the way a Riemannian distance does, mm -hmm. right? We know as we go out to the light cone, it goes to zero. Mm -hmm. We know it does the anti, you know, if you, if you do counting, then you would expect the triangle inequality and we get an anti-triangle inequality. So, you know, the, the counting idea never was right. Yeah. But whether connect, you know, how to how to bring connectivity in, you're absolutely right. This is the this is the remaining piece. My only point is that in a sum overs paths kind of approach, you might yeah. imagine that um, points with equal degrees of connectivity have physically interesting shared characteristics, depending upon the, the rules of how things propagate here. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, the basic picture is that. Is, is of course nothing naturally wants to go. As I said, it's some, something going straight up is is going to be jiggling a lot, right? It's like zitterbewegung, and it's sort of, as it goes off to the side, it kind of jiggles less. I mean, so you need to think you you might think in a kind of Bohmian setting where what you're doing is doing a kind of pilot wave, and and all of these paths are interfering with each other. That equal degrees of connectivity would give you equal sorts of of interference phenomena or something like that. That's very vague, but you're right. That's uh, exactly what, what would be left. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's suggestive. I, I agree. Very nice. Thanks. Well, we, we thank Tim for your, your talk.
And now we have finished the first part of this session. We are going to have a 10 minutes break and we return at 15.30. Thanks all for the participations. Well, Tim, are you still there? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Yeah, Shasa, I want to ask you a question because sure. it's, I know it's a, <laughs> because uh, have you tried on um, obtaining some uh, curvature in space time, like some uh, approximation to general relativity or something yeah, so, like that? Uh, I, I mean, look, the interesting thing about this is that is that if you if you think about what I was saying emerge when I said these circles kind of circular things emerge yeah they only emerge away from the away from the edges as, as you get you know you, you the sort of actual light cone structure has this square based pyramidal structure and as you approach those edges, the connectivity doesn't do what you want at all. And that's exactly where these Gaussian, this Gaussian approximation breaks down. Mm -hmm. um, so the circles kind of emerge in toward the center. So this, the story here would be that say light, if you want light to really do, produce something that looks like light cones, they're not going out along the edges. There's somehow in, in the interior. Now, if they're in the interior, then even if the bounding light cone is fixed, you could imagine effects that would, that would shift, you know, narrow or widen or distort the effective light cone, staying within those bounds. And, and that could give you similar effects to curvature, right? So it would, it would amount to an approach like when they approach general relativity by having a flat background and then and then and then doing deviations off the flat background mm -hmm. yeah um that i think is probably more the way you would go than literally trying to get curvature into the geometry you'd kind of get the curvature you'd have this fixed geometry which is really only defined at a kind of topological level um mm -hmm. and that doesn't change at all what changes is how things propagate through it. I see. And then again, what you'd like to do is, is show that that approximately gives you the same results in terms of changing light cones and narrowing them and whatever um, that you would get out of general relativity. I see, I see. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Very interesting. Mm, can, can I ask something else related to this question? Sure. So, but, and, and what about changing the rules for combining three elements to, to form these uh, three structures? So couldn't there you introduce some sort of, of, um, of curvature or something related? You, you, uh, you know, you're welcome to try. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> All I, I, can say I, is, I can see you know, that with, there are like mean, an infinite number of options. Of right? course. That, that, I mean, one thing yeah. is there are an infinite number of ways to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, you know... Um, I, it took me a long time to settle between triangles and squares, to tell you the mm -hmm. truth, right? I, I, I did that a long time ago, but I had to struggle with that. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, and, and when it comes to adding these arrows in, there are other things you could do, right? You could, you could add in fewer, you could add in more. Sure. So, you know, all power to you if you want to explore the possibilities. What I kind of tried to do, I think, is do pretty much the simplest thing that mm -hmm. didn't immediately collapse into nonsense. And amazingly, out of that falls into my lap something I had not even been aiming at, right? Yeah. Which no, is no, no, something that looks very nice, Minkowskian. And I'm just kind of astounded by it. Now, you know, maybe it's just a coincidence, but, but, but it, it, it seems think, a kind of pregnant thing, right? This is astonishing, the result. My question is this, if uh, you are thinking about um, defining the points, the very bottom at the very bottom level, uh, in terms of something like events and and uh, and uh, interactions in at the quantum level, perhaps this may be the, at the non-relativistic quantum level. I mean, I mean very very non-relativistic yeah. uh, framework, but yeah. uh, it's something to give some 
um, uh, physical content to points from the very, very bottom. Perhaps it's, it can be interesting. Yeah. I don't know if you are thinking about that. I mean, what, what I'm doing right now, I mean, there are two things to say here. One is, as I say, a kind of um, one obvious way to bring quantum theory into this is, is a kind of Bohmian picture where this is the underlying space-time geometry. You have point particles that are traveling along continuous trajectories in it. And then the quantum part comes in in the guiding equation, right? And you need that, and the dynamics of the wave function is related to this connectivity stuff, which is exactly what this kind of Feynman integral path integral formalism at least suggests, right? Mm -hmm. So then the, the you know the, the the real physical stuff is just kind of point particles moving around in a discrete space time. Um, the other thing you can try to do, which I'm working on now, is to is to put something like Maxwellian electrodynamics, which turns out to be really interesting. Um, it turns out the natural kind of natural way to do that, and this is connected to this Aronoff bohm stuff, is first, it's not even that what's really physically real are the vector and scalar potentials, but what's physically real is something that lies underneath even those, okay? So there's this, this it's a, what I call a two field U, single two field, and it gives rise to the vector potential necessarily in Coulomb gauge. And of course, in Coulomb gauge, the vector potential changes instantaneously, right? Mm -hmm. So again, you get resources for non-locality. And this is just looking at Maxwellian electrodynamics. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, how you quantize all that, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Thanks.